You know I'm right. The podcast that covers the origin stories of some of the biggest names in sports, entertainment, and so much more. Nick Durst here along with Joe Calabrese. And today, Joe, it's going to be a fun one because we get to uncover the origin stories of somebody entertainment, but more importantly, a fellow Staten Islander joining us on the show today. It's always great when we have somebody with some Staten Island ties on the program. Yeah, I'm a little upset because I'm always the most handsome Joe on this show. And now <laughs> today I'm going to be playing second fiddle to him. Um, but uh, you and I, uh, we're huge Big Brother fans, Big Brother super fans. And uh, it's nice every now and then we've been able to get somebody who was on the show with us. So you're right. He's a fellow Staten Islander. Uh, unfortunately, he wasn't able to break the Staten Island curse. <laughs> Somebody's going to do it one day. It's going to oh, happen. It's going to be you, uh, Joe. I think you got to go on next. Uh, well, we'll see. We'll see about that. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Pooch, Joe Pucciarelli. Uh How you doing, Joe? What's going on, guys? Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Course, uh, I course. love you, brother. I love sports. I love Staten Island. So, I mean, this is my cup of tea. Uh, like you said, obviously, I was hoping to do a little bit better on the show. I said that in my interviews, I was going to break the uh, Staten Island Big Brother curse. Uh, <laughs> not only did I not break it, but I went home week two. So obviously, it didn't go as planned. But uh, hopefully, maybe there's a redemption season or something one day. Because uh, really hope I get a second shot. Well, who else do we have? We had, we had uh, Alex. Alex. You squared. Yep. Tommy, right? Yep. Who else? Who else from, from style? I feel like there was one more. I don't know. It was. It was uh, Tommy, Christy, um, Christy, jo- yep. Jojo, Jojo was Gina Marie was season 15. Gina Marie was season 15. She yeah. uh, was the runner up to Andy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She, yep, exactly. Yep. So she, she came she, she came the closest, but she yeah, did not play. She did not play the best game. No, 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 no. Uh, agree. It agree. might be you, Joe. I think, I think you gotta. <laughs> yeah, I'm t- I'll be rooting for you. I mean, you know what not to do. Don't put yourself up as a pawn, which I already knew, but I was. Oh, boy. Juan always goes home. Oh, dude, I know that. Too. Being such a super fan, I knew that. And honestly, I, when I explained my like my thought process on this, is speaking to a lot of the house guests, I thought a lot of them were recruited to go on the show, um, which a few were. So I really didn't think that they knew the game you know, right. as well as I did, which was underestimating them. Because even the people that were recruited, it's, it's such a difficult process to get on that show where even if they were recruited, the people that were – after speaking to them, studied so hard that they probably knew the game even better than me, you know, because it's something where I was a fan and enjoyed the show, but they were taking this as like a business opportunity. Yeah. Um, almost like when I coach football, it's like when they were, I watched for enjoyment, they were watching like as like film per se, if you right. want like a sports process. So it's almost like that probably almost helped them. Uh, but yeah, definitely, definitely screwed the pooch while I was in the house. No doubt. Uh, I mean, pooch, you were just so relatable because like, uh, I was, wa- when I watched your intro, I was thinking to Joe, I'm like, this, you could, this could be you. Like pooch's background story is him and his mom eat chicken parm and they like, <laughs> and I was like, this is you, Joe, like right. this could be you in the future. But you know, a lot of people offer business opportunities and we'll get to big brother stuff. But before we really dive into, I want to know, for you personally, on your social platforms, what what did you go in at numbers wise, and how much did your following grow after the fact? And did you also we also hit up since you've been home by some shady people trying to do some business? Yeah, so absolutely. Um, so I wasn't the biggest social media guy. I mean, I was a college football coach, mm-hmm. um, so it was something where I mean. If I posted something on so- social media, it's like guys being guys. Like I'd get shit on for it or like get gagged for it, you know, unless it was like a football poster or a coaching picture. Um, so I'm a normal guys guy. I usually post on Instagram once a year, um, if that, you know, just just to keep up and, you know, maybe hit up a girl once in a while. Just yeah. pretty casual. Um, <laughs> but so I went in, I think, with like 1,500 followers on Instagram. Um, and then I just – I think I hit 19K today. So it's definitely been wild. Um, and now it's kind of, you know, I've been very more, you know, present on social media, uh, which is good and bad because I enjoy the platform and I'm trying to, you know, turn it into more of a college football sports media platform, which is what I'm trying to do right now, um, which has been exciting. But like you said, uh, the DMs have been a little bit crazy, both good and bad. Um, and then something was crazy. I, I started on TikTok and I never made a TikTok. Once again, it was like, you know, guys, guys, like we don't make TikToks. Guys, guy from Staten Island, you don't do that. Um, I'm trying to, you know, take advantage of the platform. Um, so I started like maybe a month ago and I, I don't think, I, I think I'm at like 41K on there. So it's been pretty cool. You know, it's exciting. Um, I like creating content. Uh, 
I like being relatable to people. I like sports. So that's really what I'm trying to turn it into. Um, so from that standpoint, I'm trying to take advantage. It's definitely weird for me, the whole social aspect, because it's like, even when I'm doing these videos, I still do them in my house. Like big creators go out and do them wherever. You know, I'm still at the point where I'm not totally comfortable. It's just not who I am naturally. I'm naturally, and it's the craziest thing, I'm naturally an introvert, um, which people, once they meet me, they're like, what the fuck are you talking about? Excuse me. Uh, but, you know, I really like if, if and I'm I'm a sociable person, but I just, I usually keep to myself if I don't know you. Uh, so it's something I'm trying to get more comfortable with, but I'm enjoying it. You know, I was blessed to be in the show and give me this tiny little platform and I'm definitely trying to take advantage of it. There you go. So you mentioned some crazy DMs. Anybody, you know, trying to, any girls trying to, trying to get in there saying, let me give you a smooch pooch or was that maybe one of your pickup lines in college? Dude, How about that, a smooch for pooch? The smooch for pooch is the PG version of some of the things I've been getting. Um, <laughs> wow. from, uh, some of the, uh, I mean, you got, you got girls, you got guys. They really, a lot of the guys appreciated the whole bit with me and Joseph uh you know, bromance and unfortunately i am a straight male so you know they are very upset when they find out usually but you know they're still encouraging uh but yeah the dms have been uh definitely out of control you know and i try to go through that some of them uh because a lot of them are encouraging and just you know normal people who are like hey either from new york or similar to my background like appreciate watching on the show you know just showing love and support and it's something where i really i just feel like a normal person which i am uh, but i do appreciate that so i try to reach back out to those ones definitely some of the other ones uh, you know, I just kind of breathe and laugh, but that's about it. Very nice. Very nice. All right. So we'll talk Big Brother a little bit. But first, of course, we got to talk about Staten Island. So for you, what was it like growing up on Staten Island? Uh, you know, did you basically go to the atrium or the mall every weekend? <laughs> and also atrium, the movie theater. You know, what sports did you play growing up? Because obviously, you're up in, in Staten Island. Sports, big part of everybody's childhood. Yeah, absolutely. So I really enjoyed growing up at Staten Island. I really did. Um, it was something where, so when I was, God, from, I think, whatever, pre-K to like first grade, I went to Catholic school and I was very, not sheltered, but kind of, you know, you're in the same class with 20 kids and it's the same 20 kids. And if you keep going, it's from like first grade all the way until you go to high school. Um, so I was happy. I actually was able to transfer out and went to a um, public school, which I really enjoyed because you meet different people from different cultures, different backgrounds. Uh, which I, you know, I just enjoy. I mean, it was part of their part of the reason I love sports because it brings so many different types of people together that you might not normally be in the same room with. Um, so definitely, once I, you know, saw the public school in the first grade, open my eyes up a little bit more to, you know, there's more than there's more to life than just Staten Island because there's people from all over who move, different backgrounds, personalities, which I enjoyed. But yeah, I played. I mean, everything. I played soccer till the eighth grade. I played baseball through the middle of high school. I played football from seven to uh, college. Um, so something where Staten Island was big in sports, you know, we're not always the biggest people on uh, Staten Island, uh, you know, but we definitely got a lot of heart. Um, but yeah, I really enjoyed it. You know, I, I had a lot of friends, um, you know, growing up you did, through sports, you know, from public school, high school, I went to Monsignor Farrell High School, loved my experience there. My dad went there, my uncle, my older brother. So definitely, you know, went up the family uh, food chain of that. Uh, in a sense, but I really enjoyed it. And it was something where the only reason I left um, was because I transferred for college. And uh, it was something where, you know, I love Staten Island, but I know there's so much more to the world. I'm actually back in Staten Island right now. And I'll probably be up north for, you know, the next year or two, because I really missed home so much. Uh, but I really loved South Florida also. And, you know, coaching college football, I was able to travel the country, um, you know, where we go to play different games. It was really cool seeing everything. Uh, but at the end of the day, Staten Island, I really do love New York. I love the city. I was out in Manhattan, um, what was it, Thursday for my first BB alumni party, which was pretty cool meeting some members of the cast, um, you know, and just being back in the city, which I haven't done because being so busy coaching. Um, it was something where I only visited home maybe once, twice a year. And with COVID, the city was really shut down the last few years from now that I'm back home it's the first time I've been mean, back out in Brooklyn back out in Manhattan and I'm like holy sh like I just love it you know when everybody's out in the streets and uh you know everybody's out and about doing stuff you know and it, it just the big buildings the ambiance I love New York I really do so somewhere I think you know I'll probably be for the next at least year or two until I figure out you know what I'm really going to be doing next so I first met Nick when we went to IS 75 for middle school okay I'm, cool. I'm from Great Kills I went to Tech so not far from Farrell. Gotcha, yeah. uh, where'd you go to middle school? So I went to 34. I is 34. 34. 
Yeah, I have a lot of friends. I went to 75, a lot of friends. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I live right on uh, right in Pleasant Plains a little bit before Tomville. Okay. Yeah, so um, you're a South Shore kid too. Yeah, yeah, but my parents are actually selling this house um, in like the next month, which is crazy. It's the house I was born and raised in. And, you know, it feels like I haven't been here in a while because I was down in Florida. So now I'm back and, uh, you know, I'm obviously selling it, which is, you know, I'm happy with what they're doing. Um, but my dad now has a place on the North Shore, so I'll probably uh, be moving in with him for a little bit. So I haven't really lived too much, you know, in the North Shore, being a South Shore kid. I um, haven't been out there too much, or I guess I'm going to be, uh, you know, exploring the South Shore, or excuse me, the North Shore a little bit more. Yeah, it's a shell shock, the North Shore versus the South Shore. I have a line yeah. about that. I'll tell you about it after we record. I don't think it's, <laughs> I got you. I don't think it's that appropriate for the podcast. I'm with you. I'm, with, I'm excited. Uh, to get there. <laughs> uh, so uh, what was the college process like for you, and uh, what did you study in college? Yeah, so my college process was very unusual because I went to three colleges. Um, it was kind of crazy. So I went, um, wanted to play uh, football, you know, really, you know, love football. It was something where, but I had a lot of injuries kind of going in and continue in college. Like I tore my ACL, got surgery on both my legs, surgery on both my calves. So I got to a point my sophomore year in college, I'd get out of practice and I would sit there like uh, in my um, locker and I couldn't even get changed for like 20 minutes because my body hurt so bad, you know, where I like didn't even want to move. Um, but that college was Stevenson University in Maryland. Uh, so I went there for two years um, after I knew football was probably coming to an end and there was no way my body could take another two years. I was like, I still want to stay involved. Um, you know, I wanted to get into coaching because uh, I have a very close family friend, Jeff Stoutland, uh, who's currently the offensive line coach of the Eagles, been the offensive line coach for the Eagles the last 10 years. And my dad are very friendly. Um, so it was something where I reached out to him, who was kind of my mentor at the time uh, for coaching. And I was like, hey, because my plan was play four years college football, then get into coaching. I was like, hey, this isn't working out. I need to speed up this process because by another two years, I don't know if I'm going to be able to walk, it feels like. Um, so I reached out to him. He was like, hey, uh, we can get you in, uh, you know, as a student assistant somewhere. Let's figure out a school where I have some connections. We'll get you in started right away. You could finish your undergrad degree and, you know, coach as a student. So I was like, okay, cool, awesome. So while we were figuring out that process, I came home and went to uh, sat, um, CSI uh, for a semester, actually, which many people don't know. Uh, so I went to CSI for a semester, kept taking classes till I figured out, you know, me and Coach Stalin could figure out a school I could step into, people he knew, uh, you know, start coaching right away and have it be a good fit. Um, so he actually worked with Coach Lane Kiffin, who uh, was the offensive coordinator at Alabama when he was the O-line coach at Alabama. Uh, so he was able to reach out to Coach Kiffin, uh, you know, was able to get me into school at FAU, was able to start me right away as a student assistant coach, uh, which was awesome. You know, it taught me a lot about the coaching industry, a lot about the coaching world. Um, so I, my third school, final school I finished at was uh, Florida Atlantic in Boca Raton. I graduated with my uh, undergrad in business management. Um, and I actually, they offered me to be a graduate assistant. Um, so I stayed there and I got my master's and my MBA in sports management while I was a graduate assistant there. Uh, so definitely a wild experience. Never thought I was going to go to three colleges, you know, in three different states. Uh, but, you know, found the right fit what, for something that I really wanted to do in my career. And it was honestly a blessing because as much as I love playing college football, coaching is so different from playing. It's a, it's a total, you know, it's just, it's, it's a shell shock because as, as a player, you get your playbook and you get the different drawings and the game plan and you just do it. And you're just like, okay, whatever. But you don't realize how much time and effort goes into all that stuff until you actually do it. Um, and it definitely, it's part of the reason, you know, I love coaching, love college football. Part of the reason I didn't step right back into it after I left the big brother house, because I had opportunities obviously because it wasn't on the show too long. Um, it's something where it truly doesn't like take over your life. Coaching is your life. And as much as I love it, you know, I, I kind of, you know, wanted to venture out and see what else, you know, with other doors open for me right now. Fair enough. I mean, yeah, it's, it's definitely all consuming, right, Joe? Absolutely. So what are some of your uh, favorite food spots on the island? Who is asking this? Okay, so I love the Nino's. The Nino's is my favorite pizza. Uh, absolutely love the Nino's. Love Lee's Pizza. Um, both awesome. Nick's uh, never been. Nick's never been to Lee's. You gotta go to Lee's. Have to. Have to. Never been to That's Lee's. what Joe keeps telling me. So he, calls, he, never, he calls he himself. Brings... He calls himself the food guy, and he's never been to Lee's. <laughs> <laughs> gotta go to Lee's. Gotta go to Lee's. That clam pie is unreal. I got some really good pizza. Um, love Danino's, uh, which is over on the. Uh, uh, oh, excuse me, not Danino's. I said Danino's. Uh, I love Nucci's. Nucci's is over on the South Shore. Another Italian spot. Love. 
uh, Reggiano's, which is uh, on New Thorpe. And then they have one in Tottenville, one of my dad's friends owns, really like Reggiano's. Um, every place I'm saying is freaking Italian, uh, which is, that's kind of the thing, you know what I mean? You go to the sense. North Shore, you got to go to Brothers for some sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, Brother, yes, yes. I've been to Brothers a bunch of times. Brothers is really good, too. I haven't been as much just because it is a little bit far from me. Yeah. Um, I really enjoy Brothers Pizza, too. Give us a bakery. Say it again? Give us a bakery, your favorite bakery. Oh, favorite bakery. You know what I used to love, and it's gone now, actually? I used to love Dominic's, which was right by yeah. Farrell, if you guys ever had it. Uh, Dominic's was awesome. And I just came home one year after being in Florida. They're like, it's gone. I was like, what do you mean it's gone? Uh, but really good. We like Dominic's. I got to find a new one now, just being home. Now, Joe always gets some in heated debates with Silence over this, but what's your what's your favorite diner on Silence? Oh, okay. So this is, I'm biased on this one. I am biased. I don't know if it's the right answer. Um, I love Paige Diner because I'm right there here. There we go. I love Paige Diner. I truly don't even think it's close. And I, I don't. It's not close. That's I, the correct answer. I could be biased because I live right here and I go a lot. Like I love, like my, like my one meal. If I'm home and nothing's going on, I'm hungry. Don't feel like cooking. I go get some. I get a buffalo uh, chicken wrap from the ba- from the Paige Diner, and I love it every time. I know what I'm getting. It's what I want. It's freaking good. It's quality. Um, you know, so the page diner, shout out page diner. I, and I, I just went to where did I go. What one was it? Was it maybe Woodrow is Woodrow? Yeah. I guess Woodrow. Yeah. Still. I went to Woodrow and just not I, like, like this past weekend with somebody just not the same, not the same. Unfortunately. I've actually seen Pete Davidson at like two 30 in the morning eating at the bar or the, the, on the stool at, at page diner. And he was with me. Really? I did. Because really I used funny. to work, I uh, I used to work in Secaucus, New Jersey, where the MLB Network and the NHL Network building is. Okay, cool. So uh, sometimes late night after two a.m., uh, if I didn't have any dinner that night at the cafeteria, I would kind of do late night page, which is like it's brutal. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> having a chicken finger melt at two thirty in the morning, like that's outrageous, <laughs> outrageous stuff. And but good, one, but tasty. But, but tasty. one night, my cousin was was like, you know what? I haven't eaten all day. I know you're still up. Let's go. And we went and it was after two 30 in the morning and we saw him there and he was kind of like, you know, in the corner doing yeah. his own thing. Nobody really wanted to bar the bar. We walked in and we kind of eye contact and we, we gave him a little nod. Like, a yeah, we nod. know. Yeah, we're we're there, yeah, sure. That's, that's our hello. We're not going to come over to say hi to you, Absolutely. but we want the acknowledgement. And he, yeah, it was fun. I'm, <laughs> I'm with you. Now, no, exactly. Give the little head nod, the little, maybe salute the head nod. That's all it takes. <laughs> they, you guys both know. Yep. <laughs> so. All right. Joe is always citing, uh, you know, We'll call celebrities, so to say, at certain places. But <laughs> most of the celebrities he sees is, is a place I'm going to guess you've probably been to, Pooch, and that's DJ's. So, oh, for sure. Uh, oh, boy. You know, what's your experience like there? Uh, did sure. you get, did you, have you gone since you've been on the show? Yeah, so actually the first, and this is embarrassing, the first, I got evicted on Thursday, um, flew back to New York on Friday, Friday night, you bet your ass I was in DJ. <laughs> um, but, you know, and I, I needed to kind of let off some steam. It was a month in Cali, you know, after being locked right. in the hotel 15 days for, yeah. uh, uh, you know, pre-show and then being on the show uh, for another 15 days, being in Cali, total 30 days, basically locked up. Definitely needed to let loose. Um, so the first two weekends, yes, I did go to DJs and party my face off. But after that, I haven't been since. Um, so I've been good. I haven't. I've been good. I neglected it this summer. I I didn't go once. Yeah. Oh wow! Look at you. You should be proud. I did not. I did a. I, I did a. Uh, we did a Tiki Monday. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. On the 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 boardwalk in Point Pleasant, we did that yep. once. Uh, we did Donovan's Reef on a Saturday. Mm-hmm. And that was that. I, I I didn't do the short thing at all this summer. I've just been pulled in all sorts of different directions. Yeah. But what we really need to do, Nick, <laughs> next, next summer, me, Johnny V, and Pooch. That's oh, what know. we Pat need Rags. to do. And Pat Rogowski. And, 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 and Pat Rogowski. We, we know our, our friend Pat, who he's the Mets beat writer for Sports Illustrated. Oh, awesome. Cool, cool, cool. So, yeah, DJs, he's, guys. He's, we're DJs I've never guys. been, so I don't know. Um, it's an experience. Know. I don't know if you would like it. I think I'd it's like a lot. It. Yes, you have to be like, like you have to be. It's 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 a lot. You know, if it's nothing, I say it to my friends down in Florida. You know, people I know. Um, and I said it to the cast on the show because I definitely brought up DJs. I was like, it's it's definitely a different experience. Like I've never been in a bar where I probably know fifty plus people. Yeah, um, yeah. and it's just you know it's wild. And I like DJ so much better during the day because uh, you can actually move around a little bit. How when you go, Joe? Sunday fun day. That's the yes, best time. My to favorite go. day. My favorite day. Bye. Nick, bye. Nick, what a, oh, see, here's here's the bye, thing bye. about here's the thing about Sunday. Nick wouldn't like it 
But for Sunday, if you get there at 11 and you stay yes. till like two or three, right before it really, really, really starts to get packed, I think you could sell Nick on that. Yes, absolutely. And it's like, you know, you know, you're down bad once they start shutting the blinds and DJs oh, yeah. on oh, Sunday. Boy. Once you're like, you're like, holy shit, it's probably like 5, 6 p.m. And I've been here since like 11, 12, which I've yeah. done before. Oh, yeah. It's disgusting, but I've done it. Um, when you're a, when you're a Sunday night center, that is. Oh, that's when you yes. Eat. And you you could tell because there are some different looking people out there. If oh, you're still on that dance floor at, you know, 11 o'clock somehow on a Sunday night and you see it is boy. you look around, you're like, holy oh, shit, I probably shouldn't be here. Some different creatures, some different creatures. Absolutely, it all, it all sounds exciting. I'm love to go. We can make it happen next. Year. It's an experience. We'll it happen it's happen it's, it's not that I'm saying it's anything like Vegas, but it's almost like hey, you could do it once or one weekend and you'll be good and never need to do it. Never need to do it again. You know. Correct. Yep. I totally agree. <laughs> yeah, we'll have to make it happen. And uh no, for sure. You know, I'm always down. You know, right is gonna be uh taking over Las Vegas in October. So open invite to you, Pooch, to come out and join us. Oh, I've October. never been, so I've never oh, been really? I've never been to Vegas. Business yeah. trip. Yeah, business never been trip. absolutely. So absolutely. Pooch in Las Vegas. But w- tell tell us about the first time in person you were noticed since the show and how you reacted to that. So I was hysterical because it was actually in the airport in Cali when I got evicted because people people uh, forget my eviction got moved from Thursday to Sunday. Um, so it wasn't a live eviction, which I didn't know at first until obviously I w- was evicted Thursday. You know, they debriefed ah. after. Um, so nobody knew besides the live feeder people that watch 24-7, the live feeds that I was gone out of the house. Um, so I was getting onto my flight from Cali and uh, to New York and LAX. And uh, somebody was sitting there and they go, they're like, oh, no, pooch. They're like, they got you. And I was like, yeah, man. I got <laughs> they were like, damn, man. He was like, yeah, I've been keeping up. He was like, it looked like you were in some trouble. But I thought maybe somehow you could get get out of it. And unfortunately, I was unable to, you know, get out of the, um, you know, the, um, you know, hole I put myself in. Uh, but that was the first time. And, then it, you know, it happened a little bit more soon. And then, uh uh, kind of the, the first couple weekends after, because I was going out a lot. Uh, but like the last two, three weeks, I've been kind of keeping more, uh, I don't even want to say low profile, but I kind of just haven't been going out much, kind of just, you know, hanging home and, you know, trying to get caught back up in life. Obviously, you know, being removed from it for about a month, still trying to, you know, get back to it, especially just moving from Florida to New York. And I'm going to be moving again in a month. Um, so a lot going on, but it happened uh, actually a quite bit, uh, you know, more than I thought it would happen. Um, it was my, it was the best, uh, what could I say, conversation in, in DJs I ever needed without starting a conversation. Uh, you know, <laughs> but it was it was the best pickup line without having to do anything. Um, you know, because people oh, yeah. to me in DJs, and it was funny at first. I would laugh, and they would be like, um, "Oh my god, are you pooch from DJs?" And I'm like, "Nah, that's not me." And they're like, "Oh, sorry." And then finally, once people knew knew, they I would say that, and they're like, "No, it's you." And I was like, "Yeah." I need to make one more point about DJs, and then yes. we're gonna move on to the Big Brother stuff. Yes. Yes. There is, there's always an experience in there where for some reason you go down with your friends, right? And there's always that one moment in your life where you find yourself alone. Oh my God. Everybody leaves you, whether they want to go to the bathroom, whether they want to go drinks at the bar. For some reason, you always end up by yourself and you always befriend somebody that you just, you get along with. And sure. like that conversation, like it sticks with you and it, it retains for the rest of your life. Right. Yeah, that's, now yeah. I've, I'm, I'm a true de- degenerate. So like, obviously I told you I didn't go there this summer, but yes. I've had a few of those in my life, but it always happens. Like you only, it, there's always that one moment that you just remember, you know? Yeah. And um, so I, I tell this story a lot. So last year uh, there was a weekend that we, I was down there with my friends and it was a Saturday that we went and I was there with my friend James and we ended up cutting the whole line because we know a couple of the bouncers there. So they yeah. got us in. And I remember we were standing by the backstage, by the back entrance, right? And all of a sudden, we're hanging out with our girlfriends at the backstage. And who comes walking in? All the guys from the bar stool, right? Oh, so it's like yeah, Glenny yeah, Balls yeah. comes walking in. Uh, Rico Bosco was already there. All the girls were there. Like Rio was there. Mm-hmm. And they're all just coming, like, and they're hanging out at the backstage with us. And, awesome. and it was and it was a night where it was like it wasn't crowded like you weren't packed yeah. in like sardines and here we are we're just like chilling we're hanging out and, and we're both looking at each other like is this really happening like on a saturday <laughs> night to us and it, 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 you always have like that that moment that you just you never forget and it's just the stars line and 
Um, I know a lot of people in there. So every now and then we'll be able to get onto the stage and stuff. And that night we were hanging on the stage with everybody. And Rico Bosco was out giving out <laughs> shirts and stuff. And he used to be a regular there. And yeah, for sure. To, to some to some degree, he's still a regular. Yeah, and you, yeah. you never, you really truly never stop being a regular. Like at no, 30, no. I was like, all right, I'm done. I'm done. <laughs> and now I'm 30 years old and I'm going to get pulled down there next summer. So, a little bit more. Yeah, 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 it's, for sure. It's, it's great. Um, but yeah, so let's let's move on to some of the other Big Brother stuff. So, like, so, <laughs> no, I love so, that. Pooch, when you first turn your phone on, you got your phone back. God. How many notifications, text, Instagram, Twitter, like all that? Well, what was it like? How yeah, so it, it was funny because it was it, it, the toughest part, honestly. So I got evicted that Thursday. They, they debrief you, you, go through a couple meetings um, at CBS Studios with the producers, um, some HR people, PR people, um, some psychologists and stuff. And then after that, they take you back for that night. You stay at the same hotel you stayed where they locked you up for two weeks before the show. I was hoping to never see that hotel again. So now I'm back. I'm like, holy shit, I'm back here. This sucks. Um, while we were in the hotel the first time, you get no phone, no computer, no TV, nothing. And for that Thursday night after I got evicted, they weren't allowed to give me my phone back until Friday when I left for New York. So no phone, computer, TV. So it's me, four walls, and my thoughts. And all I'm thinking about is, yep, yeah, is I just screwed up my dream so bad by taking such a risky, dumb decision that on week two is not necessary. I didn't get a second of sleep that night, a second of sleep. Um, I just kind of sat up and thought about, you know, my poor, poor, poor game decisions all night. Um, but there was something where I was just like, hey, I because my flight was early. Like I left. It was something where I left the hotel at like 430 in the morning. And um, uh, it was I think the flight was at like six or something. Um, but it was even like I didn't even have a clock in my room. They didn't even wow. give me a clock. So I'm sitting there. I don't know what time it is. Can't fall asleep. I'm just thinking, I'm like, for the love of God, let this time go fast. So you get to four o'clock. I handed my phone and kind of just get back to life or at least not my thoughts anymore. Uh, so finally got my phone. I turned it on. The first call I get was from my dad. And he's telling me, he's trying to tell me really what happened and who was screwing me, who wasn't <laughs> screwing me, what was going on, how I screwed myself. Uh, so he was the first person I spoke to like six in the morning, you know, really telling me everything. Uh, but after that, yeah, the phone calls and the, the texts were crazy because a lot of people who don't know the show, like they know me, but they don't know, know the show. They think that like, I either have my phone or, you know, whatever. So I have people texting me like, what are you doing? This and that. Or I have people that are like, um, cause I guess the cast came out like July, like fourth or fifth when everybody was on it. Um, you know, so I got texts that were like, oh my God, congratulations, this and that. And then people texting after like, oh, you're too big time now to like respond. Like, You're locked joke. up in the hotel. Yeah, as a joke. Yeah, but they have no idea. All we right. were in the hotel two weeks before they even announced the cast. Like we were gone. Um, so people like, and I spent my birthday um, in the, in sequester in the hotel. So people sent me birthday texts and calls and oh, I didn't never responded till after, you know, after the show. Um, so definitely a crazy experience. You know, I didn't think it was too wild though. Cause I got my Instagram back and it was only at like 3,500. So it was like, okay, cool. Not too much stuff. I got to go through. Like it's pretty normal still. And then kind of once I was out of the house is when it really blew up. Um, yeah. So it's something I'm still trying to get caught up. I don't think I will ever get caught up on like Instagram, um, and stuff like that. Um, and the first thing I did too, they tell you not to go check what they're saying about you on Twitter. Um, <laughs> cause BB Twitter is ruthless. Uh, but it was something where I'm just eager to know, you know, because I wanted to know everything was going behind the scenes, what was really happening in the house, because I was in the house and I had no idea what was going on. Um, so it was something where, you know, I definitely checked BB Twitter and they didn't have the nicest thing to say about me. Uh, but, you know, I got a lot of love, got a lot of support. Um, you know, I really it was kind of it was wild and it's still wild because I'll still check, you know, what I mean, and it's crazy because that people still tag me and stuff like um, in live feed videos when a lot of the house guests are talking about me and stuff. But all the stuff I've been getting tagged in is pretty good with like, hey, really miss Pooch. I hope he's doing well. or can't wait to see him on finale and hang out with him after the show. Yeah. Um, so it's stuff I appreciate because a lot of the house guests I truly do like, um, you know, even though I got voted that unanimously. Uh, but I still really do enjoy a lot of them. And I think they made the smartest game move and knew that. You know, I'd probably be an issue for a lot of people's games later on, which I knew whoever they kept in the game, Mia Taylor, I thought was going to go really far. Um, and, you know, they happen to keep Taylor and, you know, she's going really far. And I think a lot, especially a lot of the people that got evicted after me, um, if they ask who they would have rather kept in the game, because a lot of people's eviction, you know, had to do with Taylor and situations and they left because of that. Um, and I, I think a lot of them that I spoke to uh, would have liked to have, you know, voted me because uh, 
to stay because I think that game would have been a little bit different. Some people might still be there right now, including me. What was the audition process like for you to get on? Because you said some people are just selected and they said, you know, I don't know where to come on the show. But what was it like for you to get on the show? Yeah, so it was something where I've never done this in my life. I said to people, they were like, I was coaching college football. I had, the, I barely had time to, you know, get a couple hours of sleep, let alone apply for uh, reality shows. Um, so I had no idea what the process was like. The real reason it happened was, you know, I was always into Big Brother. Um, but once I left for college, it's like camp, football camp starts August 1st. And that's like when, like, the heart of the Big Brother is. And so it's hard. And then you get right into the season, like – like I said, I barely have time to sleep, let alone watch Big Brother, you know, so I kind of watch casually if I had a little bit of time the last couple of years. Uh, but one of the coaches, one of the new graduate assistants that started working at FAU with me was also happened to be a big Big Brother fan. So it kind of rejuiced me up a little bit, my Big Brother juices, because now that I had somebody to watch with, just like I did my mom when I used to be back home. Uh, so we kind of started watching together in some of our free time. Um, and it was something where he was always like, dude, just do it, do it. You'd be great, whatever. Cause he knows I have a big personality. I'm just kind of an idiot. Like I'm that class clown personality always. And, um, we actually went, uh, to Tampa, uh, which is like two hours away from where I was living in South Florida for Gasparilla, which is like a big parade slash event. Um, so it's kind of everybody gets dressed up as pirates and gets drunk uh, for about three days straight. So thought it would be cool. So it was my first time going. I went and I actually met Travis from Big Brother 23. He was there, too. Um, so me and my buddy were at a bar. We were like, hey, that's Travis from last season. And then we were like, holy shit, it is. We were like, let's go up to him. Uh, so we went up. Super cool guy. Uh, it's hysterical because he went out first last year. I basically went out first this year with Paloma self-evicting. But he kind of was just like, dude, like, what do you got going on in life? I'm like, hey, I'm a football coach, like, whatever. Um, and he's like, man, apply for the show. Why not? You're a big fan. Like, I didn't think it would happen to me. It's kind of crazy. And I was like, nah, like, I don't know. And he's like, just do it, man. Just do it. So the conversation we had was five minutes, super cool dude. Same thing. It's kind of like we just had a – you don't want to – when you see people out, you know, especially – like that you don't want to get in the way and you know be bothering them so you kind of have a quick conversation you kind of vibe it out and see you know if they're really you know if you're bothering them or whatever and it was like we me and my buddy happened to be drunk anyway so i don't think we really cared but thank god he see, he seemed to be super nice um so after that the drive back from tampa to boca uh, which is like i said it's two hours i really thought about it a good bit but still wasn't really going to act on it and uh, I was applying for more coaching jobs because I was coaching at FAU for like five years. And the big thing in the coaching world is you have to keep growing your coaching tree and move to different schools and meet more people because it's about who you know as much as what you know. Yep. Uh, so I was doing that. So after I applied to probably frigging 20 coaching jobs one day, I was like, I, I was like, let me just Google this quick what this process is like. So I Googled it. So if the application process was like anything more than like 10 minutes, I probably wouldn't have done it because I was super tired that day. Um, but it was like, Hey, send in a quick video and put your email in. And I was like, okay, done. Like, I'm good with that. That's easy enough for me. So I literally, my video, I still have it is 50 seconds. Um, it was nothing special. I promise 50 seconds talking a little bit about myself. Cause I didn't know. I was like, Hey, I thought of it of like, Hey, it's like when you send in a resume, like you can't send in a five page resume. Nobody's going to read it. It's just, it's going to get put away. People might even laugh at it. Like, hey, look at this idiot. You, you really thought he was going to read this five-page resume. Um, so something I thought that you'd be, you know, being quick, concise, have a lot of energy early on. You know, I thought that'd probably work. And that's, you know, what I did. And luckily enough, I did get a phone call a couple of weeks later. And I was just, like, I was in shock because I was like, I didn't think anything was going to happen after the phone call. I was probably like, they probably give thousands of people this phone call. I was like, I'm just happy I, you know, got a phone call. I called my mom right away when the lady, um, Shout out Penny Clifton, my casting agent. Uh, she was awesome. Uh, walked me through the whole process, but she was like, don't tell anybody. And as soon as I got off the phone, I called my mom after she said, don't tell anybody. And I uh, told my mom and it was very beginning stages. And, um, you know, a lot happened after that. You got to submit a bunch of pictures of yourself, a ton of paperwork, a ton of paperwork. Um, uh, you have about seven to nine Zoom interviews. Um, so it was a lot. It's very demanding. It was kind of crazy where I had to work, really work around my uh, coaching schedule. And it's something where, you know, they have a schedule too, and a lot of people, so they're flexible with you, but only flexible to a degree. So you really have to, you know, invest yeah. a lot of time. Um, you know, it was something where I truly had no idea how well I was doing because I never did anything like this before. And they keep everything so tight to the chest where until they picked me up and flew my ass to California, I did not know I was on the show. I say this to people. Um, it was hysterical because my last Zoom interview, uh, the biggest one, like once 
you have your first interview with the person that first calls you that like lower level casting agent, then you'll meet the head casting producer, then the producers of the show, uh, some other people work on the show and then the head executives of CBS that make the final decision. So I had a good feeling I was doing really well in my Zoom interviews because they just seemed to be like they give you like a 20 minute window and mine kept going like 30, 35, which I thought the more the better, just like any other interview. Um, so finally, I get to the CBS interview with the big executives and right before, you know, the head casting producer, the lady I've been dealing with, they were like, hey, just do everything you've been doing. They were like, it feels super unnatural because for like the seventh, eighth, whatever interview it is, I need you to say the same jokes, the same stories, the same this and that. Literally do. And I'm not a scripted person. I'm not. I, you know, always go off the cuff. It's just who I am because uh, they were like, hey, where people screw up is they they feel like they're telling the same things, which we want. Because like every Zoom interview is basically it's somebody, but then they add people to it. They add added more people. Um, but like I so that last Zoom interview, uh, I like saw a lot of people's faces I've seen in other Zoom interviews. And I probably was like, oh, he sounds so corny. He's saying the same joke. So I really psyched myself out. And five seconds into the interview, the head CBS guy that was running it, um, like looked down at his phone and started texting. And it really turned me off. And I was like, yeah. oh, my God, like this is going bad. Like, is he not interested? And you get in your own head. And it was something where the head casting producer told me, he was like, hey, if you're ever in trouble or I think you're not being yourself in any of these interviews, I'll stop it and be like, Pooch, are you nervous right now in a joking way? And he was like, that means I really need you to pick it up because I know you're not being yourself. And in my last most critical Zoom interview, he said that and stopped the interview. And that is like an oh shit moment. I knew I had to turn it on and really, you know, turn this around. But like at the same time, that also psyched me out because I was like, okay, if he said that, I was like, I felt like it wasn't going well. He said it, it's probably not going well. So I was like, I had got to turn it on right now. And uh, thankfully I did. I still honestly didn't think it was good enough to get in the show, which was really disappointing because all my interviews I thought were really good until that. And it was hysterical because a lower level casting agent that w walked me through the process wasn't on that final interview. But I called her right away and I was like, oh my God, I was like, I screwed us. I was like, I'm done. I was like, I'm not getting it on. I was like, I'm sorry, I screwed you. You invested so much time into me. I was like, I just ruined it for everybody. Uh, me, you, everybody included. And she was like, calm down, calm down. Uh, she was like, everything like, she was like, nobody texted me yet about anything. She was like, if it was that bad, trust me, I would have got a text. Um, so that was probably in January, February, March, a probably end of April. So end of April till like the end of May, beginning of June, they don't tell you anything. I didn't hear anything besides they like send you forms to a couple more paperwork. Uh, they make you get some blood work. Uh, but until that, it was tough because I was finishing my grad school. I only needed two more classes to get my master's. And they started um, in like the last week of June, beginning in July. And, but you have to sign up about a month early. So I was talking to them and I was like, hey, uh, any idea, like if I'm going to hear back anything like anytime soon? And they were like, honestly, we like probably it'll probably be too late. So like, what do you want to do? Like, because we don't want to like, we're going to feel super bad if you don't take these classes and then you don't get on the show because they're like, we really don't know yet. And I was talking to the head casting producer, Jesse, and I was like, hey, man, I was like, I was like, just tell me how you feel. I was like, I know you can't promise me anything. If it doesn't work out, I totally get it. Won't hold it against you. But like, am I in the thick of things? Like, do I have a shot? You know, because I know it's probably thousands of people like and they tell you you're getting closer, you're doing well, but you have no idea. Like they don't tell you how many people, what? Um, so he was like, Hey man, he was like, I'm just saying like, I can't promise you, but like, if I was you, I would go through with it and just see like roll the dice, see what happens. So that was good enough for me. You know, I take chances in life. That's kind of my thing. Some work out, some don't, as we saw in the show, um, you know, but I took the chance and ended up working out. And it was funny because, um, they, because they don't tell you what's going on. I knew just in case I wanted to move from Florida to New York to make sure I wasn't paying for my lease still. Right. Um, so it was something where I had to move all my stuff from Florida to New York. And finally, when I was found out I was on the show and leaving, my moving truck wasn't here yet. Oh, so I had to go to the Staten Island Mall and Target and buy a bunch of shit. Uh, <laughs> I had nothing. My moving truck literally wasn't here. So I had nothing to leave with. Um, and I, the way that happened was they were coming to film my bit where they like uh, give you the key and stuff. And uh, they were like, hey, we're going to come do this. Um they were like, you know, they don't tell you you're leaving, though. They literally don't even tell you you're leaving. I was like, hey, should I be ready to leave tomorrow, too? And they somebody started laughing and they were like, um, we can't say that. But if I were you, I'd be ready to go. And it was already like four o'clock and I ran to Target in the mall <laughs> hours, for like five, six hours and bought like thousands of dollars worth of shit just so I had stuff to go on the show. Um, but it, so it was my experience getting on the show was absolutely wild. It truly is. They do such a good job of 
you have no idea. You truly have no idea. Even even when I was there, when they handed me the key, but they won't tell you if you're a substitute or not or a replacement. Right. So I don't even know until like I stepped in the Big Brother house and it, the day before, I had no idea if I was on the show or a substitute or replacement. If, you know, after these two weeks in a hotel, they were going to send my ass back to Staten Island and be like, hey, you were a replacement. Like, I'm a very realist in the sense of like, why me? You know, there's thousands of people. So I was like, hey, I'm going to sit in this hotel for two weeks and they're going to send my ass back home to Staten Island and it's going to suck and I'm going to be super upset about it. Um, but thankfully, I wasn't a replacement. I was chosen to be on the show. I was blessed. Thank God. Um, you know, and it was, it was a crazy experience. And I, I really, for anybody out there who's thinking about doing it, go through with it. You know, it is, it is demanding. It's a lot. The process isn't easy. Uh, the best advice I could say is turn it on right away. Like in these interviews in time, they have hundreds, thousands of other people they're speaking to just don't fake it. Don't not be yourself. But if you have that energy, that personality, they need to see it right off the bat. You can't like take time to get into it. What a story! Incredible. I know. Amazing. We had, last we had a uh, Christian Birkenberg on last season. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. He was an alternative. Yes. Uh, yeah. Somebody yeah, dropped, so he ended up getting. I guess COVID test positive, mm-hmm. so he ended up getting in. So that was a very friend. But yeah, what a crazy process that they're just like, hey, well, uh, maybe we're gonna cast you. We're gonna come film tomorrow at your house, and then the next day you're leaving. Yes, like no yes. time notice there at all. They don't so. even tell you. Yeah, I thought like the whole process, I'm thinking like, hey, they'll tell me they're going to come film this day. But I was like, if I'm filming this day, I'm not leaving this day. So I probably have at least like three, four days after they film. And then when once I, I literally I was sitting in my driveway and some, the guy was like, hey, I'd be ready to leave tomorrow. And I had nothing done. Nothing. Like I didn't have any. I had like four T-shirts with me that like <laughs> I brought my car from being home when I drove from New York to Florida. Wow. The rest of the shit was on a moving truck. Um, so like I said, it was absolutely a wild experience for me. Definitely. Yeah, definitely rough to adjust. And I mean, I can only imagine if you work in a, you know, a nine to five job, how hard that is. Like, oh hey, uh, I got, I'm not coming back to work tomorrow. <laughs> and it was just terrible. I think I it was because because I was coming home from Florida to New York, I wanted to make sure I had a job in case this didn't work out. Because as yeah. I was leaving, it's still nothing was definite. So I accepted a job with the Yankees doing ticket, doing sales, you know, um, wow. So it was something where I was going to uh, be doing like, uh, what was it? It was like season ticket sales and yeah. stuff like that. So I accepted that. I was supposed to start on a Monday. As I'm driving from Florida to New York, I could tell things are getting closer in the process. And I was like, hey, I don't really want to start with these guys and then just leave like three days later. Like that'll be super jacked up. I was like, I should probably because now that it's getting closer and like because they, they finally start sending you emails like, hey, you're in the top 50. You're in the top 25. Yeah. So I found out I was in the top 25 and, you know, I was getting good vibes from people as I got that email, as I was driving home. And like, it, I think I was driving home on like a Friday. So we was supposed to start working on Monday. So I called the guy from the Yankees um, and he was actually super cool. Uh, Cause he was like, Hey, he was like, honestly, this is really bad timing. He was like, you're supposed to start Monday. He was like, I told my boss, like I had to put the, a, a team of people together. So he was like, he was super nice about it, but he was like, I'm not going to lie. He was like, I'm kind of screwed right now. So what I need you to do is send me an email because I couldn't tell him exactly what was going on because I was like, it was basically like I, I was giving them the pitch of like, hey, yeah. dude, I was like, hey, dude, trust me, basically type of deal. I was like, hey, I was like, I'm not leaving for like another sports job. I was like, it's not something where I'm just getting paid more. And I like left last second to screw you guys. I was like, this is a life changing opportunity. And like he, I could tell I felt like I owed it to tell him. I didn't tell him, but I was like, hey, I have an opportunity like um a television show on a major network like abc uh, nbc cbs and that was all i said because i didn't want to give too much um and he was just like he was trying to he was like is it sports related this i was like i really can't <laughs> say it I was like it starts in july i was like i'm telling you I was oh like, that's that's a giveaway it starts yeah, I, in july I, I, but if he's not a big brother fan i was hoping he didn't know and like, have you other- have you spoken to him since you've been home so I was actually hysterical. I was at DJ's as the law turns out, everything knows everybody at DJ's. So I was at DJ's and I didn't meet him, but I met somebody that would have, was on that team, that sales team that I would have been on. Cause he was like, Hey, wow. Pooch. He was like, Pooch, right? He was like, yeah. He was like, I just Ooh. started with the Yankees too. Like we still talk about you, like the whole team and the boss. Cause he was like, he was like, I, he was like, the boss talks about how he got that call from you and didn't know what the hell was going on. And then obviously it came out in July, you were on the show and obviously everybody got wind of it. And uh, he was like, we talked about it. And he was like, he was actually interested after you got, you know, evicted, if you'd still want to possibly come work, uh, because he'd be open to it, which was super cool. The guy was awesome. Really nice guy. It was something where, you know, I'm I'm really trying to get into sports media right now more than I am, uh, especially college football, you know, more than I am back into sales. Um, So it's something where it was pretty just funny how that worked out, you know, because if it 
wasn't on the show, I probably would have been driving to the Bronx every day uh, doing oh, sales okay. and baseball, um, which would have been definitely different for me. So, and I'm not really, I'm not saying I don't work hard because coaching college football was, God, you wake up at 630 in the morning, you're at work from six to 12 at night for seven days a week. It's just something where it it was a, like a fun, exciting job. I'm not really your typical nine to five job. That's just not me. Um, you know, I need something with like a goal, purpose, uh, excitement. It's just something because uh, well, it's very tough for me to sit at the desk all day and, you know, do some paperwork, unfortunately. Absolutely. I mean, it's grinding. I I think you would have uh, you would have done well in ticket sales, but I think you would have hated it. So I yeah, I, I honestly, I think too, it's something where just I think my true personally couldn't have came out. I think I'm a sociable person, and in that standpoint, would have been okay. But the real pooch, I think, wouldn't have been shown in ticket sales. Um, you know, I like he was shown on Big Brother, and I think even more of the real me if I lasted more than two friggin' weeks. Uh, would have been shown <laughs> too. I think people really, really would have appreciated it, but unfortunately, uh, hopefully, maybe next time. Fingers crossed for uh, Pooch on All Stars down the road. Yeah, we'll yeah, for see. sure. I need. I'm hoping maybe like a redemption season because I feel like that. You know, how about how about, how about the challenge CBS season two? You, I was so I'm a big fan of. The, I was a big fan of the challenge on MTV. Um, I haven't been watching a whole ton of TV, but I have tuned into a few of the challenges on CBS. I love TJ Lavin, uh, the the host. Of I the keep challenge. telling Joe, you got to watch the challenge. He yeah, the challenge. So many big brother awesome. people. He refuses to watch. A challenge, especially. I just like the whole. The challenge is more. I, I feel like it's almost like adultish Big Brother, where there's not really a lot of behind the back being fake, like backstabbing. Like if you don't like somebody, you, you vote well, them in the fun. elimination thing, and it's like there's no pawns. Like if you get voted in, you're hoping that person goes home. Right. So really, it it draws lines early, and I like that because I I'm not as good with the fake BS. I don't kiss ass well. I really don't. Uh, so sometimes it was tough for me in the Big Brother house, but the challenge is more of you know I feel like my cup of tea. So I would I'd be really you know. Excited to open to it, so we'll see. We'll see. Let's hope. Let's hope. Uh, yeah, sure. For you, how challenging was it to shower and go to the bathroom in the bird house? <laughs> so honestly, it didn't bother me. It was something where you know didn't really didn't bother me. It's kind of something where you know I don't wear a lot of clothes to begin with yeah. usually anyway. So You're used to the college where, locker room, right? Yeah, yeah, in a sense, yes. It's something where I'm, I'm trying to you know it was kind of the way I put it. It was like an adult sleepover. Like when you're a little kid, you have sleepover with all your friends. Now you're doing that, but you're an adult. And I just like, I like being around people. I like where I'm in the shower and there's like five other people either brushing their teeth or, you know, chilling around the little <laughs> light couch in the shower, uh, the little sit down area. And you're kind of just BSing. And I'm in the shower you know, as you, I'm BSing, talking to people. I don't know. I enjoyed it. Um, people did a really good job. Honestly, you would think with 16 people, it would get disgusting. The house does get nasty, more of the kitchen and the fridge, honestly, because it's kind of the, the kitchen or excuse me, the shower bathroom area. Everybody really does a good job of making sure it's decently clean, you know, because if not, people are going to get pissed, um, you know, so it's something where well, it's also got to be presentable for TV. Yes. You after they do make us clean. Right. Yes. So it's I'm trying before Thursday live evictions, they make us clean the whole house. They like give us cleaning supplies and we they make us go to work. I like, got every piece of the house. Um, because like you said, it has to be presentable for TV. So right. they really do make it that way. So, like you said, once a week, there's a whole like, even if it does get a little nasty, there's a whole rundown, like deep clean of everything. Um, so it really doesn't get too bad. The worst thing is the sink. The sink, some people are like the thing that bothered me the most, because it's like a lot of people are more of like just throw their shit in the sink and let it sit there. And everybody knows the more shit sits in the sink, the harder it is to clean. And it just piles up, you know what I mean? And then it always gets stuck with like two, three people, like just take turns doing all the dishes. But it's like, dude, if everybody just washes their own dishes after they're done eating, I was like, then there's nothing there, you know, but you can't even say that because you don't want to rub somebody the wrong way. And some people in the house did say that and it did piss people off and you see it. So that's why I was like, it was hysterical because I, I think I was talking to Turner and I was like, you just talk about your game plan and this and that. And I was like, dude, I was like, you, because everybody too, when you cook, there's only two stovetops for 16 people, which is not a lot, you know what I mean? So it's a lot where if you're cooking, you're usually cooking for everybody. And I was like, I was like, fuck, I was like, I'll be Bobby Flay for the next fucking two weeks. I was like, I'll cook every fucking meal if I have to, you know, it's just something where I was like, I'll clean every damn dish. I was like, I'll do what I got to do. So where people like you, you know, and even that wasn't enough for me, you know? So at the end of the day, it really does come down the game because I know there's people that people didn't like living with, but even you keep people, you know, just because at the end of the day, you're, yes, you want to keep roommates you like around, but at the end of the day, you're fighting $750,000. Yeah. Know? I think if I was in the house and one of my roommates, like in my room, 
snored, I'd go after them right away. Oh my god, you got yeah, so yeah. off. I, I had the worst it. snorer maybe in Big Brother history, Terrence. Oh. Like, I, I was in the room with Terrence. And I thought it was good, you know, because Terrence being an older man, you know, something where we didn't have a ton in common. And me and Terrence actually ended up being super friendly because um, he gets a lot. He's a Terrence is super sociable with anybody, you know, so, and he does a really good job in that sense. Uh, but he is Snorlax. It is tough, man, because <laughs> he goes to sleep like 10 o'clock at night. And the reason I liked it is because I was in the room with Nicole, Terrence, Turner and me. Um, so I didn't mind it. I kind of all the people were cool. And it was nice because in the Big Brother house, there's no light switches. So they turn the lights off when two or more people are asleep in a room. So it was nice because uh, Nicole and Terrence being a little bit older would go to sleep early. So they'd go to sleep like 10, 11. So when I came back at like uh, like four in the morning, because I was like one of the latest up in the house. I just, I don't know, I'm young. I like being up late, BSing. Um, so when I would go at like four in the morning, the lights would already be off and I wouldn't have to wait, which is nice. But I would have to listen to the friggin' snore machine, uh, which was definitely painful. Um, and it was tough because even I couldn't get away with it. Week one, that was my roommate. Then I volunteered to be a have not because I'm like, hey, I'm on the block. Let me earn some good grace. I'll volunteer to be a have not. And then and Terrence volunteers too. And I'm like, oh my God, dude. I'm like, you guys are killing me. So that was definitely oh. one of the toughest parts. Bad, really. One of like my dad has sleep apnea and it's like that bad. Terrence probably has sleep apnea. It's bad. Yeah, he probably needed like his mask or something. Yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> it, yeah, it was it was rough, man. It was especially in the have not room. It was uncomfy. It was it was that was a tough week, and that was the week I got evicted. So not a lot of fun that last week. So, so wait, you, uh, wait. I want to ask about being a have not. So the room is the hardest part. It's not the cold showers. It's not the slop or anything like that. It's the room sleeping on pool floats. This um... so it, yeah, it was even in like people were like, oh, it's not that bad. But the pool the pool floats are so oddly shaped where it's like something's going into your rib cage, and then it's like you have a gap, and then there's something that's digging back in your back. So it was not fun. I slept on the floor the week I was in there. I got you know. A couple like little towels I gave you. I slept on the floor. The one thing with that room with the whole pool club like thing, uh, you know, theme of it, it was freezing. So the big brother house is cold to begin with, but that room was probably like 55 degrees. And you're sleeping on the cold on the floor. Um, the room was definitely rough for me because there's no getting away from that. The cold showers, it's like, okay, if you really want, you could cut down the shower like once every two days if you're not working out and sweating, this and that. Um, you know, the food was tough too, because I especially I have a, a sweet tooth. And it was hysterical because I was eating Tums as candy and America was kind of enjoying that. I would, the recommended uh, dosage, I think is seven Tums a day. I think I was up to like nine at one point uh, mm. just for a little flavor in my mouth. Uh, Cause the slop is just, it just, it's so bland. It's so bleh, where it's really tough, you know, uh, but being a have not, you see it on the show and you're like, Oh, it's not that bad. It's pretty damn bad. Definitely didn't. Enjoy. And especially, so was, there, was there a separate shower or how do they monitor you? Yeah, so one one shower is strictly cold. One shower is okay. warm and cold. So one shower is um, the okay. shower on the right's warm. The shower on the left is nothing but like cold. And it's not like it's not like room temperature. It's cold. Like yeah. that thing, they are, it is friggin' freezing. So it's definitely not fun because I love a good night, you know, warm shower. I really right. do. Um, so it was something where definitely tough. Being a have not was not fun. If they told me they were going to evict me, I wish they just told me, let me enjoy my last week of peace in the house. Uh, but obviously they didn't give a shit, man. We're some ruthless people, uh, which I respect the gameplay. Uh, but yes, your boy was a have not, did not go well. So this this is something that really irks me on Big Brother. Uh, you didn't get to participate in this, so I can't call you out on this, but maybe you would on this way. Why is it when everybody goes into the dire room to vote for an eviction that they feel the need to go above and beyond to compliment Julie on how she Yes, doing. I knew this was coming. I knew it was coming. <laughs> I, I think it's almost like a big brother tradition almost. And it's hysterical because you can't see Julie in the room. You only see a camera. So we <laughs> speak to the camera. So you don't see Julie. We do we do see Julie when we're sitting in the living room and the TV's on. We do see Julie. So we're able to you know see her. And Julie does usually always look really good. Um, but when they actually say it in the uh, in the DR room, you can't see anything. But that's like you were saying, I didn't get to participate in it. Because of the backstage boss, I only competed in two challenges. I never got to evict anybody, you know, in two weeks. Um, I just didn't – it was so – I didn't, never got to be HOH. It's just it's so much of it. It's like I wasn't even on Big Brother, you know, at the same time. It's like there's so much I didn't get to participate in, which was tough. Um, so I really hope at one point, you know, there's like a redemption season or something, and maybe I could, you know – get a phone call and re-interview that, you know, I promise I'll give them what they want. I, I, I'll tell you that. <laughs> if you, uh, if you lived long enough to see Zingbot, what do you think Zingbot would have said to you? Uh, he, he, he would have had a ton of material. It would have been his pickings. <laughs> I mean, he could have done anything he wanted, man. 
from the hair to being Italian to, you know, being an absolute class clown slash fool um, to anything from the, the friggin' lisp I had, man. He could have went to town on anything I friggin' have, man. So it would have been interesting to see how maybe one day I'll get there again. But uh, I'm sure he was disappointed because I'm sure he had a lot of material. So maybe maybe one day. Right. So you mentioned people already that you had uh, relationships with and you pretty much enjoyed the whole casting. Uh, you're going to be staying in touch with all of them. Uh, is there any one or two people in particular that you were super, super close with uh, that you know you're going to be close friends with uh, well beyond the show is over? And uh, are there any, any other reality stars who have reached out to you uh, since you were evicted and you've been home? Yeah. Um, so actually, um, it's hysterical because my closest person I was in the house with my final two. And I mean, I, I think I'll be really close friends with outside the house was Turner, which is kind of crazy because they did the whole bromance bit on me and Joseph. And me and Joseph, yes, are very friendly, are close. But me and Turner, man, we're like the same person, which is crazy because. We're so different, but the same, you know, if that makes sense, because I'm more of, you know, no tattoos, clean cut, Absolutely. clean cut, more sports background, Turner's head down to here, uh, you know, tattoos everywhere, more of like the artsy type. And it's just it's hysterical because, you know, because of the world we live in and first impressions, it's hysterical. We both walked into the backyard on opening night and you eye everybody down and get your sense and you start to, OK, I might be able to work with him, can't work with him. And, you know, usually first impressions are always wrong. And it's hysterical. Once we got so close, I don't know how it happened, but we were talking and we were like, dude, we both thought there was no way we'd get along. They were like, we both thought we'd be on opposite sides of the house. We were like, because we both thought, like, we're, we look so different where, in a sense, we were like, we're going to be able to, like, the house isn't going to know how close we are. But we saw that we saw the walk around the house like this. You know, it even became a joke if like if I was in the HOH room with somebody and it's not that he was doing it just happened to be they were like, oh, look at Turner. He's looking for pooch. And they'd watch on the turn, the, the camera monitors. And I think he was just looking for people But they came out. They'd be like, oh, he's looking for pooch. And then he'd walk in the HOH room and be like, what's up, guys? And they'd be like, oh, you're looking for pooch. And he was, no, I'm looking for everybody. But we got that close. And that's how it looked, which was tough, you know, because we definitely got labeled as a duo right away. Um, so it was something where, you know, did, we, we didn't play to our advantage the way we would have liked to. Uh, but Turner, Joseph, Monty's an awesome dude. Monty is such a good dude. I think, you know, at least those three for sure. Um, I was very friendly with Kyle while he was in the house, even though he kind of screwed me, um, which is unfortunate. Um, but, yeah, a lot of the guys, I thought we really could have taken it far. I think they did smart what they did because I think the girls had power early on. And, you know, some of the guys had to jump off ship. Turner and Joseph always had my back. Even Monty, I've seen some clips. He was going to bat for me until he knew he realized he lost a battle and then he couldn't keep fighting for me or it hurt his game. Um, so especially some of the guys, you know, I really got really close with them. Um, I actually met up with Amira already one night in the city and it was hysterical because Amira was the reason for my eviction. Yeah. She was the mastermind behind it, uh, but she's a really cool person. And we both said it, we really should have worked together. And it's, you don't realize, you know, it's kind of tough when you're in the house, you're really not the real you because your guard is up a little bit. Um, Hopefully uh, you and Indy can uh, rekindle your <laughs> romance. <laughs> Me and and Indy's hysterical. Indy's, I had a lot of fun with that because she had the same personality where it's like, I like to make people laugh. I really do. I mean, it's kind of my thing. I enjoy it. I like, you know, I'll, I have no problem looking like a dumbass or an idiot, you know, to make people laugh. I just enjoy it. Um, so I definitely, you know, like doing that. Uh, with it. But it was tough, too, because at the same time, because, you know, of my personality, I got, I got labeled as a wild card by some people. Because one of the first big alliances of the game was Pose Pack, um, which really dominated the game the first week, week and a half. And uh, I saw a clip and they're talking about it, that, that those group members, six, seven people, and they were like, hey, Pooch should be in the two. And they were like, yeah, yeah. And then they were like, wait, he's kind of a wild card. Let's not keep him in. I was like, what the hell did I do in three days to be labeled as a wild <laughs> card? Backstage boss. Yeah, but besides crack some jokes, you know, which I just, it's tough because it's like everybody liked being around me and they liked it joking Pooch, but at the same time, they don't totally trust him. And it's tough because it's like even in my coaching, you know, lifestyle or world, it's like, I love being, you know, like I said, class clown, cracking jokes, keeping them like the mood light. But at the same time, when it's down for business, I am super serious. Like some people have trouble if they're that funny guy turning it off and they always try and be that. But I have no problem. Once it's time to be serious, like I cut it off, it's gone and straightforward seriousness. Um, you know, and then even in my football job with like promotions, different things, I think a lot of the coaches, when it came time for promotion, they thought about the pooch who was cracking jokes and being funny, not the pooch who was there at one in the morning, staying, you know, later than everybody you know, putting in extra work. So it's tough because 
it, obviously that bigger personality takes president because it's way more, you know, out there than it is the quiet pooch, you know, working his ass off. So even in the house, I think it truly did hurt me because, you know, you get labeled as a wild card because people are kind of scared. They're like, hey, he might say something that rubs somebody the wrong way, which I do know that fine line. I really do. I would never cross it. Um, but it's tough. But, you know, I, I'll, I'll never stop being me, you know, telling a couple of jokes here and there, keeping the mood light, you know, gets you in trouble sometimes or gets you, you know, uh, you know, screwed. It is what it is. I mean, I just it's who I am. Yeah. When you're in the house, uh, I, your assumption uh, about a lot of people are different. The perception is probably different when you're in the house. I'm sure you get an inkling based on, I guess, who's getting called to the diary room, uh, who you think. The producers are favoring or kind of trying to showcase i guess you get an inkling of oh, maybe america likes this person maybe america likes that person uh is there anybody in the house where your perception of that person versus now that you're reading like big brother twitter and you're outside the house and you're kind of seeing the full scope of everything uh is is there somebody from the house where your opinion was different in the house and now it's different outside the house uh, and what do you think about America's favorite house guest? And who do you think the front runner and the favorite for that this year is going to be? Yeah. So it's, it's hysterical because it's very early on that first week. It's like, and like you said, I try to take notes of everything of all that you have to, when you're in the game, it does help. Um, but like week one and two, it's tough because it's like, you know, that the, whoever had a household is going to be in there a lot. I was in there a lot my first week because of the backstage boss. And even they cut so much and they put you in there a lot. And like, like they'll only lose three, four minutes and you'll be in there three, four hours, you know, different days. Um, so you kind of, you size it up by that and you size it up by like who they're calling. But it really is tough, especially when there's that many people being 16 people, everybody's getting called. If anything, you know, this who's not getting called. Like the first two weeks, Turner never got called, which was hysterical because um, he was getting pissed. He was like, dude, why don't they want to talk to me? Uh, which is super funny. Uh, so finally... No, actually, after I left, his personality started coming out a little bit more. And I think they saw that and started putting him on more, uh, which I'm glad because he really is such a funny dude. Um, but I'm trying to think. Uh, maybe, you know, Brittany. Brittany's a little bit more faker, you know, than she she plays that nice, sweet girl role. Uh, but I am, I'm petty towards Brittany because she was the only person who left me a mean goodbye message, uh, you know, so I don't hate her, but I definitely am petty in a way where it's like, what was that like? What was that about? Um, you know, she plays that, you know, innocent role, but she's really not. Um, so maybe Brittany, who I thought was a little sweeter uh, than she actually is, but maybe that everybody else kind of was the same. But it is funny because in the die room, they sometimes ask you to say things. So how it works is. You go in and you don't just start rambling. They ask you questions. You know, they start asking you about things and then you speak on it. And then they're like, okay, can you say it this way? Because they need it to edit it for TV for it to sound clean and concise yeah. and to the point. So they, it's like there's writers helping you and they use your thoughts. They help you say it this way. But they will also ask if you'll say a few jokes or like this and that. Like for me in the mermaid competition, they were like, okay, do you, will, will you say for us this is the first time Pooch can't find the hole? And I was like, yeah, that's funny. I was like, I know what you guys are trying to do. You're trying to play me. Like, <laughs> you're trying to play me as like the, the jock, funny guy. I was like, it's kind of uh... who I am anyway. So I was like, yeah, that's funny. I'll say that. So they came back the next day and they were like, hey, we actually couldn't use that. It wouldn't get passed by CBS. They said, hey, let's do this. Say this is the first time Pooch couldn't find the sweet spot. I was like, yeah, I'll say that too. So I said both of them, you know. So there's times like, where – Like that's any better. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> so there's times where uh, you could tell because once I started watching the show when I got out of the house, I was like, okay, that's not them. Like they're not saying that. Like that might be their thought but not in those words like right. i get to cbs is putting that together for them so it's, it was very easy i never thought about that until i was out of the house and i was like just like when i watched mine i was like that wasn't fully me i like could watch you know some of the other house guests and now that i know them very well being in the house 24 7 for two weeks i was like okay that wasn't how they really worded that you know so we know you like to do the coaching thing um, but what is next for you? Do you think there's a chance that maybe if you get another opportunity to do a, a reality TV show, maybe like the challenge, which one day I'll watch, don't worry, Nick, I'll watch <laughs> the show one day. Uh, but if something else came across your way and, and somebody really wanted you to, to take advantage of it and do it, you know, would you do it? Or are you right now just kind of hyper and focus on continuing your, your coaching career? Yeah, um, so it's something where I think I'm going to put coaching to the side for right now. I really do. Uh, this opened my eyes to, you know, there's so much more to life. 
you know, coaching, like I said, dictates your life, dictates your schedule, dictates where you could go, when you could go, um, you know, when you could see family and friends, where you live, you know, it dictates everything. And it's a lot. And I love coaching. I'm actually coaching now. Uh, I'm coaching at Staten Island Boys. My dad's been coaching there for years, years and years, and he's still doing it. And now that I'm home, he asked me to help me, obviously, you know, with my college football coaching background. Um, so I coached my first game last Friday. We got absolutely smoked. Uh, coaching 10 year olds is very different from coaching college kids. It really is. Um, so I'm hoping, uh, you know, we have uh, practice tonight in about an hour. So we got some work to do. We got some work to do. We're definitely uh, going to get some things together. But like I was saying, um, you know, I really am going to put college coaching to the side right now as much as I love it. I do miss it watching this first weekend of college football. I do. There's nothing like being in the stadium. My first game last year, uh, opening season, was at the Swamp, a night game. Wow. And, you know, with those juices, 90,000, yes, dude, 90 plus thousand people going wild. You're on the sideline coaching. Um, nothing gives you that thrill. Nothing really does. And I will miss it. And I don't know if I'll ever go back. I don't. But right now, I'm kind of look. I'll big brother open my eyes in the sense where I'm looking to see where this takes me. Um, and I, I'm only 24. I don't think people realize I was the third youngest person on this show this season. Uh, Paloma was 22. Turner was 23. I turned 24 uh, four days before I went into the house. So freshly being 24. Um, there's just so much to life. You know, I really uh, I for right now, I'm going to continue to try and grow a sports, um, uh, you know, content in a sense, on my page. And that's really what I want to do and get into sports podcasting and stuff like that. I just, you know, I am not in that, not, you know, going to school in that field and not knowing a lot of people in it. It has been tough, you know, now knowing what I know, I wish I went to school for like editing and stuff because I'm trying on YouTube. I'm trying to learn Adobe. It's a lot. It is a lot. It's a skill. Absolutely. And I respect anybody who does it. Um, So I'm really trying to learn and, you know, trying to teach myself. (laughs) So it's a slow process because I'm trying to do that while I put stuff out on Instagram and TikTok and you know trying to work out how to create a, a youtube and the, the biggest thing for me is i don't want to put out shit content you know if i put it out i want it to be done right and it's tough because i know i'll have to put out stuff and it'll probably be a learning curve and not all of it will be the way i want it to be but i just have to really start putting stuff out but at the same time i hold myself to a high level of like i don't want to like i said put out shit i want it to be good so it's kind of what i'm doing now um i probably do need to find more of a steady job soon because that uh savings is going fast uh, <laughs> but yeah um i would love you know I, I love adventure i love challenges i love you know different opportunities so if something came you know i would be very open to it i really would and it's not like i'm a you know because people i hate when they say it it does dig at me a little bit they're like oh you're trying to hold on to your 15 minutes of fame it's like, not really, man. I just love life. I love excitement. I love life. I love, you know, you only live once, you know, and I love different opportunities. And, you know, fortunately for me, I was able to go through this crazy life experience, which was a once in a lifetime experience. Um, like I'd never been to California and I was able to go to California for a month and I'm going to be flown back out for the finale and be able to probably stay out there for a week and really explore. And that never would have happened, you know, if for not for this. So, you know, I love, you know, I just love living life and this has been really good to me right now and I'll see where this goes. And like you said, I really do hope there's opportunities because I think, uh, I think uh, I didn't get the full, you know, I didn't think everybody got to see the real pooch and I think they would enjoy it. I really, I really do. Um, So we'll see. And if it doesn't, you know, it's just, it wasn't meant to be and then things happen and life will go on and I'll figure something out and it'll be great. And hopefully the sports stuff goes for me. So we'll see what happens. I'm really excited to see what the next couple months go. Just like the uh, unofficial college football team of this show, the Rutgers Scarlet's Knights, you got to keep go. chopping away. Big win, and, uh, big win this week. Yes, there, yeah. Keep going there. Now, I see a baseball jersey behind you. Yeah, yeah. So the question is, and me and Joe want to know, are we going to be seeing Pooch on our men's softball team next season? I'm sorry. Dude, I would love to, man. I got a hell of a bat, I'll tell you that. That was always – I mean, I was something I played. The only reason I stopped in high school is because when I did uh, tear my ACL, I wanted to focus yeah. on uh, football. Uh, but, man, now that I'm home, yeah, I, dude, dude right. sign me the hell up. We're going to gonna hold you to it. We're going to hold you no, to I it. No, I swear, man. I'm sorry. And it ain't something I promise. If I was a liability, I would tell you. I wouldn't be a liability. Right. I probably haven't swung a bat in years, but I promise I'll get up there. You'd be like, damn, it's pretty natural swing for not swinging a bat in years. So I tell you, I think I still got it. You know, we'll right. see. But definitely, well, right now, we better. are, unfortunately, back-to-back championship game losers so oh, okay okay so maybe I might you piece. put us you're the missing piece, piece i think <laughs> man i would love that that's awesome <laughs> all right we'll see we'll, we'll see what happens so if our audience stay tuned for that Absolutely. in the future of course uh pooch want to ask you here you know either recently with everything with the show or your life or your career here 
Give us your you know I'm right moment. So what I mean by that is a time where you want to do something, you ask somebody for advice. They said, you know what, Pooch, don't do that. That's a horrible idea. That's that's going to backfire on you. And you said, you know what, I'm going to do it anyway. And ultimately, you will see why it is that I'm right. Yeah. So, I mean, that moment for me definitely was, you know, I had opportunities to, uh, so I was leaving FAU. I had different opportunities to go coach and the whole big brother process was going on. And in the coaching world, it's all like people recommend you. It's not like you apply. Like somebody tells you there's an open job that you worked with. They recommend you. You speak to people. And then if you get the job, you're basically like on their resume in the sense where like they put their back out for you. You know, so I had a lot of people in the coaching world that really liked me. And I had a few job opportunities. And it was something where I refused to take any until uh, unless I thought it was a drop dead, like can't turn it down, you know. And I, there was a lot of safe job opportunities at some really decent schools. And it was something where they were like, my, like, especially my dad, you know, he's like, you're not going to take this. Like, what do you mean? What reality TV? Like what? Like, you're not going to, you have to take this. Like, it's a decent job. You stay in the coaching world. Like it's important. You get to, you know, keep growing your coaching tree. You're in division, you stay in division one football, you know, which is not easy to do coaching. Um, so I got that from a lot of people and I really had to, even people go in the bat for me for jobs. I had to be like, Hey, I really appreciate you like recommending me and stuff, but I was like, stop the process now. Cause I was like, unfortunately I'm not going to take it. No. Like, what do you mean? You're not going to take it. And I was like, Hey, if I get it, I was like, I can't tell you what's going on, but I was like, it, it potentially could be big. And like, what, what they mean potentially. So it could potentially be nothing. And I was like, yeah, it could potentially be zero. It couldn't be shit. Um, but I was like, uh, it's something where, Hey, I just was willing to take the chance on myself. I really was. And it's crazy. Cause the first thing I did when I got the call back was Google how many people ap apply for Big Brother a year. And the number that kept coming up was 30,000. So I was like 30,000. I was like, there's no shot in hell. I end up on this show. I was like, zero. You know, I mean, literally zero. I was like, what, what special I bring to the table? And I kept kind of going through. And there was a lot of times during the interview process and stuff where I probably could have just given up because it was either time demanding or I like had to work around my schedule. And I really had to adjust a lot of things and make up a lot of excuses with work and, you know, get around this, but then stay late and do this. And then there was a lot. And a lot of different times I really could have said, you know what, whatever, it's probably not going to work out anyway. Um, you know, and I didn't, and it was something I'm so glad that I didn't. Cause I promised there was times where I swear to God. So it's hysterical. Um, after my first interview, they send you like a, like a basically paperwork, like 15 pages, almost like an essay that you have to write about yourself or like questions and you got to fill them in. So I was like tired one day after work, barely filled it in, you know, didn't give it my full effort. It was like, Hey, it's probably just paperwork. They don't look at it. So I filled it in. She called me that like two days later, she was like, Hey, I'm telling you right now, this isn't good enough. And in my head, I'm like, what do you mean? It's not good enough. Almost like you're like, not pissed, but you're like, at the same time, you understand she's trying to help me. She's on my right. side. Right. So she knows it's not good enough. Like she could tell I didn't put my all in it. I probably didn't. And it was something where, you know, I could have take that negatively, you know, and I could have, you know, been upset, be like, hey, screw this, like whatever. But I was like, hey, I need to focus in, do this. You know, I need to make sure it's better, put the real me into it. And then she was like, hey, this is, I did that. And she was like, this is 50 times better. Same thing, they asked for a bunch of pictures of you. And I don't have a lot of pictures of me. I'm a guy, I don't take selfies, this and that. <clears throat> so I sent some BS pictures and she was like, hey, this really isn't what we're looking for. Like, I need more. And I get, and like, you just got to, sometimes you got to do more, you know what I mean? And instead of it's the biggest thing is taking constructive criticism. If I got all butthurt about this con constructive, con uh, uh, you know, consider during the show or during the process and was just like, Hey, no, screw her. You know, I could have been, I wouldn't have gotten the show probably. And I'm so glad that she really got the best out of me and was able to get me on the show. So those kind of two moments where, you know, take, taking a chance on myself and not taking the college football coaching job. And then also during the actual process where uh, at times she was like, Hey, I need more. And, you know, I was, I knew I had more and I gave her more, just, you know, it took a little bit more to get out of me. Um, so kind of just taking advice from people, you know, and knowing when to take a chance on yourself. And then sometimes when people, you know, know you have more to give, you know, don't take it in a, in a way where I don't get upset by it. Just, they know you have more to give. So I'll give them more, you know, those are probably my two moments. That's awesome. Pooch, we appreciate your time. This was a lot of fun. We're going down the shore next summer. Oh, we're for gonna sure. Bring, we're going to pop next Sunday, fun day, cherry. <laughs> Man, I would love that. Uh, and do you want to get into content creation? Uh, Nick and I have backgrounds in that. Obviously, awesome. our podcast, we do sports media and stuff like that. So uh, we're all in the same wavelength here. We're always here for advice. We're always here to help you out. You know, we can help you. At the same time, you're helping us here. So again, Absolutely. Really, I would really, really appreciate, appreciate that. Really and what we do here at the end of the podcast is we always give our guests the last words. 
So uh, if there's anything else you would like to share or promote for yourself, I'm sure there's probably one thing that you haven't yet. So uh, by all means, go ahead. And again, we, we really appreciate your time. Thanks again for doing this with us. Yeah, thank you guys. This was amazing. I really appreciate you too. Absolutely. If you guys um, are listening, want to go out there, just follow my socials, man. It's uh, all, it's a P-O-O-C-H-I-E underscore M-A-N-E-E-E. Uh, Pucci Maine, kind of like Gucci Maine. Felt like it oh, would yeah. be... Uh, be catchy. I'm not nowhere in the same tiers or rafters as Gucci. I know that, but um, I felt like it would be, um, you know, catchy. So if you follow me on Twitter, Instagram, um, uh, TikTok, you know, that'd be awesome. I also have my, where I'm starting to put my college football Instagram together. That's in my bio of that Instagram called Pooch Picks. Um, so it's something where I, you know, I love sports, you know, I love making people laugh. So I'm trying to mix that together. I really am. Uh, but like I said, thank you so much. I really, I, any opportunity I have to do these, I love talking big brother, love talking sports and, you know, just a little bit about myself. Cause I really like, you know, it gives I'm a normal dude. At the end of the day, a normal as dude always will be, you know, it's something where I don't want people to think that maybe I think I'm not or, you know, whatever. Um, so I kind of just give hope that uh, to people where if they think they can do this, they can, because I promised my life a couple months ago was very different, you know, and I'm so blessed for this opportunity. And I would love, you know, for somebody to listen to this, you know, and then they're able to apply and get on and it helps change their life. Um, so really appreciate you guys for having me on and definitely hope to keep in contact with you guys and hope everybody enjoys the podcast. All right, there you have it, Pooch. It's been a pleasure. And, you know, we're going to see you on the softball field next year. But we all live near each other. You know, you're, you're, in, you're down there in uh, Pleasant Plains in Tottenville. Joe's in Great Kills. I'm in Prince's Bay. So we're all around each other. So I'm sure we'll see you soon. Uh, no doubt about that. We wish you the best of luck with everything moving forward here. And that's going to do it here for this episode of You Know I'm Right. So for our very special guest, Pooch, my co-host, Joe Calabrese, I'm Nick Durst, and this has been You Know I'm Right.